People who used to sell decks as an easy project. I remember when I was a kid, we'd go to the home center and you could pick up a free pamphlet, like for many home projects and building a deck was one of them. And I can tell you, my dad had no business building a deck, but we did it anyway. Well, there were no deck codes back then, so. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building science and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Kylie Jacques, Design Editor. Hello. Matt Milham, Deputy Editor. What's up? And Jeff Rose, producer. Howdy. You can find Free's podcast and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Are you drinking a beer already, Matt? It kind of no, looks this, that way. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's in a... <laughs> Anything goes. Why not? Festival. Yeah, this is in a beer festival glass. I'm, what time right. is I'm it? not drinking one. 9.30? I'm good. I'm ready. Yeah. It's iced tea, actually. <laughs> sure it is. Uh-huh. <laughs> It's been a long, long time. Long Island. Been... Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time since you've been on the show, Matt. What are you up to? That's true. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, well, mostly just trying to get the last issue out the door and uh, personal projects, working on a bunch of different things. Still working on the breezeway. Got all that stuff painted, actually. The, we should remind you folks. So you're, you're putting cabinets in your breezeway to make like a mudroom. Yeah. And so the initial batch of cabinets, I, you know, I think I, there was a picture of those on the podcast at some point. That's mm -hmm. all painted now. That all looks nice and everything. Nice. Then we sort of painted shifted. What, what'd you, did oh, you do a color? I'm sorry. Did you do a color? Or? Yeah, it's like a white. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not like a all color. All colors together. <laughs> okay. Just trying to picture it. Uh, yeah. No, there. It's I don't know some sort of a cream cool. color. I don't know. Mm -hmm. We repainted the whole breezeway so that it's not whatever weird gray blue that it was before. Um, then moved on to the bathroom, one of the bathrooms I should say that had pink and black tile from the fifties. So, oh yeah, so my sister bad. had a bathroom like that. Ugh. Yeah, and we don't really want to. The plan is to sort of like change the the layout of all that at some point, and that's a little too ambitious for right now. So. Uh, Repainted that. Painting Did you take down the tile? tile? No, left the tile up. Um, I have a, a grinder. It's basically a polisher like you would use for polishing concrete countertops. Yep. And uh, just put the 50 grip pad in that and scoured up the tile real good, uh, like which was tedious and took a long time. And then uh, we cleaned that up good, put a bonding primer on it and uh, and painted it. And it cool. seems to be okay, but so is it inside the the tub enclosure too? Did you do mm -hmm. that as well? Wow. I'm yeah. interested to see how that holds up. So I know a friend. Oh, I'm very curious too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a friend who did that, but they didn't abrade the tile. They just used the bonding primer and a and a special paint, and, and it didn't yeah. last very long. Yeah, but... yeah. It, yeah. I think you really. I, there are some products I saw that didn't mention anything about scouring it, but a bunch of them did one we used was a ben moore product and it did that has to help yeah. i would so i you know we'll see i mean man the, the idea Did wasn't you... that this was going to last forever yeah <laughs> it's just sort of like get Some rid I... of the pink and black tile for now yeah. or at least cover it so i guess Did... you you've decided that that is never going to come back and be cool again <laughs> <laughs> If it is, I don't want to live that yeah. it's, it's my fault. Matt, did you wear a respirator while you were doing that? That sounds really yeah, nasty. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, it got pretty – well, let's put it this way. Heather did most of it, and mm -hmm. um, that was a good I move. made sure that she wore a respirator. <laughs> well, I was in here, so, you know, I mean, it's a little hard for her as a teacher. Like, you know, there's nothing really for them yeah. to do while this is going on. I mean, she prepares her – you know, whatever she does and puts it up on the internet, but there's no face to face time. Um, so yeah, she did the vast majority of it and it got a little dustier, I think when she was doing it than when I was doing it. Cause I made sure stuff was very wet. So there wasn't mm -hmm. much dust. Cause I've done, I guess was she works harder than you. <laughs> she definitely was taking, <laughs> I don't know I what like the it. technique was. It took, a, it took her a lot longer to do the parts that she did than the parts that I did. <laughs> um, she's not a builder and this probably no, done that's this stuff thing. before. It's like, yeah, I know that was the thing. I've, I'm like, I've you I've, thank her. <laughs> I've spent hours and hours. I don't know, probably days grinding countertops. So, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> what did all, you do? This this was all pretty much in in my masonry class in school. We built, I think, four 
counters, four pretty big counters. For you? No, for different, some were for clients, some were just for practice. I mean, That's a lot of the project the grinder. Yeah, well, no, and then I bought this grinder for myself and, you know, I was doing projects here too. So I, I built a, a hearth extension and some uh, tabletops and stuff like that. So, well, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's been busy. So what color did you paint the tile? Uh, also white. <laughs> uh-huh. It's uh, whatever color. I think it's the same color as the ceilings in the rest of the house. It was like a Chantilly lace. I think it was what it was called. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> yep. I like, I like you saying Chantilly lace. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, how's your bedroom? It's more or less back together. So that's, that's nice. It's, it's like sleeping somewhere else. Yeah. Did you take the opportunity to throw a bunch of crap away? Uh, not really. Um, it's more like moved crap from around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's next on your your agenda? Uh, well, time to go start working outside. I guess probably. Mm -hmm. You haven't t dealt with your lawnmower, I bet. Um, I, I fiddled with it a little bit on Sunday. Um, got some improvement, but <laughs> you just need to flatten your lawn, yeah. and the mower will work great because it won't go up hills. Yeah, well, if I if I do it horizontally, you know, across the the width of the hill, it's not too bad. But <laughs> Kylie, have you bought your mower yet? No, I can't. I can't justify that purchase right now. So back to my real mower. <laughs> have you sharpened it with a kit from Amazon? No, I haven't even done that. I'm not, I'm not bringing new products into my house. unlike you guys right now, but it's still got a little <laughs> life in it. I can, I can make do for a little bit longer. Okay. So I have three pile, I mean, three yards of mulch, uh, piled up out there for me to get busy with later. You're going to burn it. <laughs> no, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to mulch my beds. Oh, I see that kind green of envy. I got gotcha. you. Good stuff. Very spendy. This is what I spend my money on. The <laughs> landscape. So you guys know I ran out of windows to install in the barn, right? <laughs> so um, yes. <laughs> for at least a year, uh, we've been looking at Liam's carpet and, and horror because it was just so nasty. Uh, it was a 10-year-old Berber carpet that was put in when we moved in. It was cheap then. And obviously, 10 years didn't do it any favor. So <laughs> um, we decided to, with Liam's uh, buy-in, to empty his room, which was a formidable task, <laughs> and then um, rip up the carpet, which he did last weekend. And um, he wanted he his closet, closet removed because it's always been dysfunctional, and it makes his room really small. So uh, this past weekend, we... Um, patched the drywall in his room. When I pulled down the walls with his help, um, we found an electrical cable and our um, communication cables running in the partition wall that formed his closet. So we had to relocate those and I didn't have any Romex, so I had to get that. So currently the microwave uh, cable, which luckily is a you know dedicated circuit, has a a plug end on it and it's plugged into an extension cord into the basement receptacle. <laughs> so uh, yesterday I got some cables, so I'm going to fix that permanently. And uh, there was enough slack and the communication cables. I was able to disconnect those, reroute them and then just plug them back in. So um, at first I completely abandoned them. I was like, uh, they're all phone jacks. Right. And I'm like, we get our phone through the cable company. So I don't even need these things. So I've been calling my mom every day during the COVID crisis and uh, I went to, to call her and I got no dial tone. I'm like, oh no, I didn't think about that. Because <laughs> yeah. even the cable company plugs into the phone jack to supply the phone, you know, the landline. So I had to uh, mm -hmm. reconnect that and it worked out. So um, there's some photos up on the podcast page of my boy um, screwing the drywall patches in. And uh, then Sunday, perhaps his most ambitious undertaking was... <laughs> I gave him a six inch uh, sander that I bought a few months ago and he sanded all the paint off the hardwood floors. So much like in our room, they're very imperfect, but they're going to have this kind of rustic quality and they'll match our room. So um, once again, my the builder who sold us the house had uh, stolen flooring to patch other parts of the hardwood floor in the rest of the house. 
So I just spent a, a few hours on Sunday patching as much as I could. And I, I, I've ultimately decided I'm going to, I bought a bundle of uh, red oak flooring to patch in the rest. There's this little rectangle that where the, it were just in front of the door that we're going to make, uh, it's not going to match, but it'll match the rest of the floor. So it's going to be fun. Cool. So when you said he ripped up the rug, did he do that all by himself? He did all, all by himself. He put the pieces into contractor bags so I could take them to the dump. Um, yeah. And he's he sanded the whole floor the second and uh, third times all by himself. I helped him with the first pass with the 60 grit paper to get the paint off just because that's uh, – that's that six inch sander when it's on yeah. its most aggressive mode with a low grit <laughs> paper on it is freaking a lot of work to control. It is exhausting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh. He said to me, I was like, uh, I was like, do you like this kind of work? And he's like, well, it's better than sitting around doing nothing. And I, I you know, <laughs> it wasn't yeah. the best endorm endorsement, but it was in, <laughs> it was in the right direction. Could have been um, a lot worse. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, um, he said to me, he's like, you know, this is really physically exhausting work. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, you're right. And anyone who says otherwise is not doing it right. <laughs> and I believe that. Or not doing it at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's been a pretty good experience for both of us. I I, I wish I could be more patient. Um, I assume he knows stuff and he obviously doesn't. He has no experience doing this kind of stuff and uh, trying real hard to be a good dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's how builders pick things up a lot of the time, right? As kids doing stuff with their dads. I, I learned a lot. And, yeah. uh, and you know, people used to ask me less so now because I'm old enough, but they're like, how do you know this stuff? Or how do you know mm -hmm. this thing? And uh, and I at first I used to think it was just, you just know stuff. It's just common sense, but that's not true. You see other people doing things and, and you learn uh, through watching them, I'm sure. Exactly. Uh, did you help your... Uh, Parents with projects, guys. My mom used to strip a lot of furniture. We did stuff like that together. She was pretty crafty. Uh huh. Did you enjoy that work, or was it yeah like a, a burden? Did. Yeah, I liked it. We had a lot oh. of fun. We'd go to antique, you know, flea markets and pick up stuff and strip it, paint it, stain it. You know, it's not really patient but with you. What's that? Yeah. Was she patient? Yeah. How about you, Jeff? Oh yeah, all the time. I mean, that, that was, that was our weekends was fixing stuff, do, building stuff. Did, was your, were your parents patient with teaching you things and working with you on stuff? For the most part. I mean, my, it's pretty much, you know, my dad did it and I watched and held tools, you know. <laughs> That's what I remember too. How about you, Matt? Yeah, a bit. I mean, I remember my dad changing out the boiler in our house and the house I grew up in. Um, just That's getting an ambitious that, project. Uh, yeah. Well, and just getting the thing down in the basement. <laughs> That's fun. Um, redoing the roof on that house. That was, it was like a, it was over 4,000 square foot Victorian with like an 1812 pitch roof. And, he had you up there? Oh yeah. We were up there <laughs> stripping off the five layers of shingles that were oh over the, the skip sheathing on this thing. <laughs> So, uh, you mean, know, Matt, so that, that explains sometimes... a lot about your character, Matt. I gotta tell you, <laughs> totally. you are one of the, you know, like, uh, yeah, you, you, you know, don't Matt... give up. You just do stuff. Yeah. One day you should put a photo of that house up. I think people would really appreciate seeing it. It's really yeah. something. Yeah. It's quite beautiful. Looks a lot nicer now than I think when, when I lived in it. <laughs> uh, architecturally and, you know. Yeah. That no, was a nice house. You Would guys you are ever... lucky. My dad was a sculptor. He was useless. He was an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I hung out drawing. <laughs> so was he into uh, architecture? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I can't answer it. We didn't talk about that. But, he, you know, he had an artful eye, obviously. That's how he made it. Yeah, his that's why I was wondering if that was one of his, like, He may have been. Interest. I think I was, yeah, I think it was too young to know one way or the other. Well, what do you guys think of the uh, Pro Talk podcast that I've been doing uh, the uh, uh, you know during the week without y'all, which not excluding ex including Jeff, of course. Have you listened? Yeah, uh, I think people are liking it. Yeah, I I listened to a little bit of it. I didn't, haven't gone through an entire episode yet. Uh huh. Well, most think? of my podcast listening I do in the car, 
and I'm not yeah. driving anywhere anymore. <laughs> totally. So dig it. Yeah. How's it going for you, Patrick? You, you getting a lot out of that? Oh gosh, I really enjoy it. So the the really cool thing for me is I get to talk to really smart people and just let them go. I don't, I try not to say anything except ask them questions and let them talk. Mm -hmm. And um, you learn a lot. <laughs> you learn a lot. I was talking to Steve Basic yesterday. The show's a half hour, but we were just having such a good conversation that it ended up being an hour long, and we'll run that over two weeks. Um, and uh, you know, he it's. It's just really interesting. I, I I love it, and I hope folks who are listening will uh, provide feedback on how we can make it better or what they think, who who they think we should have on the show. I, th I think that would be awesome. How are you cool. choosing topics to talk about? <sighs> I don't know. These are just uh, these are my own questions I have for these people, and I I, I base it on um, you know their expertise. For example, uh, yesterday I was talking to Steve Basic a little bit about affordability because that's been a theme in our in our podcast, mm -hmm. and um, uh, that was really interesting because uh, what you know I think architecture has a role in the affordability crisis. I don't know exactly what that is. He had some thoughts. It was it was it's interesting. Should we take some questions? Sure. Yeah. So this comes from Doug from Colorado. I have a design question for you to ponder as you are all stuck at home. How many decades do you think it will be before people start adding walls to their open concept houses? Most of the home makeover shows start with blowing out a lot of walls. Yes, I do admit to watching some of them, although I avoid the ones that never mention pesky terms like permits or inspections. <laughs> One exception is HGTV's hometown, but that may be largely due to the age of the homes they work on. If you look back at the changes in home design since the turn of the century, you see the pendulum swing slowly. After 1900, large farm-style kitchens became smaller. Maybe with central heat, people didn't need to gather around the cook stove for warmth. By the mid-20s, we had efficient galley kitchens. My first apartment was in a brick fourplex built in the 20s, and two people could not walk abreast throughout the kitchen. High ceilings became lower. With the advent of sheet goods, the, higher, the height became standardized at eight feet. After World War II, the need for houses led to developments like Levittown, small homes that would be built fast and cheap. Even by the early 60s, there were still developers offering homes as low as 10,000 bucks. Can you guys imagine that, that you could buy a home for 10 grand? No. You can't buy a third of a car for 10 grand today. <laughs> yeah. um, these uh, homes were not especially well built, but they did fill a need. And I would add, not only did they need that, people made a lot of money when they sold them. This is like how the uh, working class in America started to build their wealth to become the middle yeah. class. Yep. Um, gradually in the 70s and 80s, homes got larger, kitchens grew, and two-car garages became standard. The 90s and early 2000s led to McMansions and everyone trying to outdo their neighbor. Now we're more concerned with energy use and building efficiency, and uh, we want them to last, but the open concept is here to stay. Do you think this is forever? I like it. Or will design trends start to swing back to walls? Okay, let's we'll, let's leave that alone for a second. Finally, I have two more design questions. Why designers on filling furniture with pillows till there's no room to sit? And what the hell is a spa-like bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> he's, too, he's hit on two of my you know, cringe points. <laughs> so the first thing I do, you know, we used to spend a lot of a, a time in hotel rooms and the same thing on a hotel bed. There's like all these stupid pillows that I feel bad putting on the floor because some people might actually want them in the bed, you know? <laughs> I think that's about, and, and I hate this statement, but it's the, or, or I hate this phrase, but making a design statement, it's, I think pillows are touted as one of those things like paint where you can really transform a room just by making, you know, throwing some accents down. I think that's what that's about. But in case you need to turn it into an emergency insane asylum, <laughs> to put them on the wall. <laughs> or you're suddenly charged with like watching a half dozen toddlers <laughs> yeah. with, my, with the floor. <laughs> Uh, so what do you guys think about this question? Do, do Will houses go back to small rooms or is this open concept thing here to stay? And, well, and why is it open concept? I mean, the private rooms are still private. I mean, I don't think anybody has a bedroom probably that, you know, is open to the rest of the house. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it just makes a space definitely feel bigger to have all that open. And it makes, I mean, in my house, the it's not open concept like the kitchen is not open to the the living dining room area um and i can't imagine putting a, a wall up 
to sort of separate the living and dining areas, even though they're not really well defined as it is just because of the, the, the shape of the space. But um, either of those spaces would just feel way too small if you did that. And it would make it even probably harder, it seems like, to like really arrange stuff in there in a, in a way that made it feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. So as terrible as it is, it would be even worse, I think, if I put walls up. But I mean, and I think that kind of applies to a lot of other houses that I've been in, that are at least ranches. Smaller um, houses. Yeah, smaller houses where it just, there's no good way to put up walls and, and make the house actually feel like a comfortable place to be in to me. So I think the reason with the more more walls in smaller homes is you just physically need more sp- wall space for furniture and yeah. cabinets right you just like you need walls to put things against mm-hmm. i agree i think the open concept is uh, applicable and effective in smaller places where you want more light to come in um and you need more flexibility i think with the space that you have but in large houses the open concept can feel really cavernous and ill-defined and just sort of amorphous like I actually love the fact that Doug sent this question in at this time, because here I am spending all of my, most of my waking hours in my open concept house. And I've never lived with this floor plan before buying this place. And it's bugging me a bit. Um, I can't get away from my cat. (laughs) (laughs) And he drives me nuts sometimes, you know, it's like, there's just no place. But the other piece of it is just organizing and my place is small. So there are things about it that work really well, but I think um, organizing the space, as you kind of alluded to Patrick is, is really more difficult. I really struggled with how to arrange my furniture. And now I feel like there's no other solution. Like this Mm -hmm. is it. And I'm not going to change it for the foreseeable future. Um, so I think in some ways they're, they can be a little less flexible, um, but I, I'm actually, I found a couple of pieces that cracked me up that Doug should probably check, check out. He's a f- fan of the open floor plan. It sounds like, but one is, um, in the times called, um, I'm over the open concept and the others from the Atlantic, the curse of an open floor plan. And they make some very good points. I just think, um, it's probably is here to stay, but I, I think it doesn't always work. I don't think it's a given that an open floor plan is the way to go. I think in larger houses, some privacy. And in fact, in one of these places uh, or one of these articles, the woman, her point was that I'm putting up a wall and it just has to deal with it because it's the thing that makes most sense in this, in this room. So. I think especially now, like, uh, families all being together and working and going to school, what have you, you need to to define spaces, right? To, to, you know, to get away from each other, to get work done. Um, I think the whole idea of it being like facilitating connectedness and the whole, like, it's great for entertaining. And, but the truth of the matter is you're kind of combining labor and leisure. So yeah, you're all entertaining, but you're also looking at all the pots, you know, for the person who's hosting, they're probably more concerned about all of what's going on in the messy zone than what's happening in the social zone, right? I mean, they, I they need to clean up because they don't want folks to be yeah. like uncomfortable with their kitchen mess, right? Right. I uh, so we we have a uh, the kitchen is connected to our you know our very small kitchen is connected to our very small living room and it, it works pretty well. Um, the the kitchen is dysfunctional because it's so small. Like if you open the dishwasher door, you can't get around it. If you open the kitchen door or the refrigerator door, you can't get to the rest of the kitchen. So, I mean, but I don't know what else you do because it's just a really small space. Yeah. And making it open would be worse because then we wouldn't have any cabinet walls, right? Or any walls to put appliances. So. Yeah. For anybody interested, though, it is sort of um, enlightening to look at the history of the open floor plan. I I wound up kind of getting into this topic and there's there's a lot to it. Where'd it come from, Kylie? Its origins sort of date back to the turn of the 20th century, but it became more popular in the, um, you know, with the rise of modern architecture in the form of ranch style houses. And and then there's this whole other side to it where like building materials and spans of steel and that influenced the ability to be able to do it. And there's just a whole lot more to it than I'd ever given thought to. It's kind of interesting. I thought, you know, I'd never think thought about like farmhouse kitchens as doug suggests being open concept right that's just like they were just big spaces but that is what it, and it, i'm sure he's right that people needed to gather in there because they would have froze to death otherwise well and you also would have gotten just cooked the hell out of there with that mm. gigantic stove running when oh, you're yeah. trying to cook so that's the other thing smells 
Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I was actually mentioned this to my wife yesterday. Maybe we want to put the door back on the kitchen Mm because that was one thing that we did when we bought the house because it's just, it was an annoying thing, just always in the way. And, you know, when you're carrying stuff through, you're just constantly banging into the doorknob. And so taking that door down was like, you know, probably the fir- one of the first things I did mm-hmm. besides ripping out the mantle. Um, <laughs> what was wrong with the mantle? <laughs> oh, it was just some thing that somebody had tacked to the wall. I mean, it was probably original to the house, but it was just, it looked terrible. It was mm. painted, I don't know, like some kind of brown crinkly paint. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Tacky details in your place, man. <laughs> yeah. And there was, yeah, I don't know. It was terrible. So I, it came off real easy. I barely even needed to pull on it. And it just came right off the wall. So, but yeah, taking out that door um, kind of, you know, makes it easier to move through the place. But yeah, that we, there's no rain shed. So then whatever you're cooking just like permeates through the entire yeah. house. And that's something I don't really enjoy. So exactly. if you're going with open concept, you definitely need a really, really good fan or really I think good that's very uh, true. exhaust. Hmm. I'm in that same boat, Matt. I agree with you. I think every kitchen needs a real good range hood. I yeah. Mean, mm-hmm. it's, I've lived with them, and it's not good, right? And It's not. Uh, well, yeah. We added one to this house. It, it, it didn't vent. It was one of the recirculating things, which don't do anything. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, question comes from Walter. Dear podcasters, I've listened to all the podcasts. I have two observations. First, never do a podcast without Kylie. <laughs> Sub observation, <laughs> find more people like Kylie. Aww. That's so nice. <laughs> Second, it is nice. Second, maybe once a month or so, have a person who makes a living doing renovation uh, come and talk on the podcast. Well, we would love to. So, uh, especially for that's a perfect pro talk idea for sure. I live in the Central Carolinas and I have an east facing deck built in 2003. The planks are five quarter by six, mostly clear, untreated pine. I don't think that's true. If they're pine, I think they're going to be treated. I put a clear sealant on the first few times and a semi-solid stain the last time a few years ago. I have a habit of leaving clay flower pots on it, and eventually I got rot. So I have some time on my hands. I'm thinking of pulling up any board with surface rot, most but not all, flipping it over, reinstalling, and then putting a semi-solid stain on. This keeps the wood out of the landfill, improves the appearance, and may prolong the life of the deck boards. I have to make some judgment about what constitutes too much damage to reuse. First, is this a terrible idea? Uh, first, hmm. the, the board could, let's, is, is this a terrible idea? Aren't you guys gonna chime in and say yes? <laughs> yes, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> because yeah, I don't like the idea of hiding the rot. It's an admirable idea though, given his motivation for doing it. But it's a bad right? idea. And some, some <laughs> things are admirable, but still a bad idea. And I think this falls yeah. into that category. Yeah. I mean, I think you could repurpose the wood for something else where it's not in a structural capacity, mm-hmm. where it has to, you know, bear the weight of people or plants or whatever. But, um, you know, if his idea is trying to keep it out of the landfill, but if it's just trying to, you know, make your deck look better, I, it, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. It's a bad idea because, you know, at a minimum, you pop through a deck board and break your ankle. Uh, more catastrophically, you fall all the way through, or a child does. So, I mean, you can't. This is a structural issue that just needs to be repaired. And uh, when you pull the deck boards up, you may find that the joists are in good repair, or you may find that they're rotted too. So, uh, you, you got to look, and it's 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 not. The stakes are high. Yeah, rot begets rot. I mean, like something that's rotting that's in contact with something else that's fine will start to rot that other thing. So, and people, what people don't realize is that the fasteners that hold the deck boards to the joists provide a pathway for uh, water to start to get a foothold to you know facilitate that rot process. So, yeah, because it never dries out of the small spaces. Um, Second, the guy who built the deck would have put the side up that he thought should go up. The internet is unanimous in saying that if you put the wrong side up, it will soon lead to cubbing and splitting. However, it is not (laughs) unanimous in saying which is the wrong side. (laughs) (laughs) So what he's saying is he's asking, is it the bark side up or the bark side down? Some people describe it as the rings. uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What I mean, this is such it's kind of a silly debate. Like, I mean, if you were just to take a log and plane saw it, you know, cut it, you know, so that you had that sort of ring, you know, the cathedrals and everything, it will always want to curl toward the bark side. But when it's in a decking application, it's a little bit of a different thing because you're exposing just one side of that board to moisture. 
So it will, if the top is getting wet, those fibers are expanding and it'll want to curl down pretty much regardless of the way the board is sawn. If it's in equalized conditions, it will almost always want to curl toward the bark side is basically the way furniture builders, I think, think of it. So they'll alternate boards. So, you know, like rings up, rings down, rings up, rings down. If they're building a tabletop out of, uh, out of plain sawn lumber, uh, for that reason, but a deck is a completely different thing. And it generally, it is best to just put whatever is the nicest face up because you're going to get cupping anyway. <laughs> There's almost no way to avoid it if you're in a place where this stuff is routinely getting wet and then you have vapor drive pushing that moisture to the bottom. So it's going to curl possibly different directions at different times, which is why you use screws or screw type fasteners to keep it down. I got little to add to that, except that um, you can... Uh, slow this problem, the, these situations that Matt describes by putting a vapor barrier on the soil, if, especially if you have a low lying deck, you yeah. want to stop that vapor drive from soaking the undersides of the deck boards, all, you know. Um, How low is low? I'd say less than two feet. Hmm. If you can climb under it, you're probably okay, but um, it's also a good idea in any deck to put um, gravel under it and that yeah. a, a, creates yeah. a capillary break. A yeah. lot of people don't want idea. polyethylene in their landscape, and there are probably yeah. some good reasons for that. And um, yeah, gravel will pretty much solve that for you. Okay. I should do that too. I have one of those types of decks. It's, it's a good way to make your desk, deck last a lot longer. I want Actually, to get back, get back to the okay. flower pot problem. Yeah. This, yeah. This, <laughs> this is a common problem. And in fact, mm -hmm. I went out to California with, to see Jim Grant, who was doing a cedar deck refinishing piece. And this client was really into potted plants on her deck and it rotted a bunch of the deck boards. And the simple solution is to put your plants on stands. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they're not soaking the deck boards all the time, right? And and there's part of that article, we had a web extra that showed how to build one that was part of the deck. Uh, so you didn't have to like take it in seasonally or whatever. It was it was like amounted to a short railing that you put your pots on and it, it looks cool. So that's cool. That's what I would do uh, to get to solve that problem. You, you could even just put them on little blocks of wood, like yeah. anything. You know, yeah, just to get some airspace under there so it ventilates and dries out. And I've seen little clay blocks for this very purpose, right, Kylie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just align the whole of the pot with the crack between the wood boards. <laughs> <laughs> so it drains between boards. And I agree with him that the internet is unanimous in saying that if you put the board the wrong way, it's going to ruin your entire life. But um, and I would also yeah. agree that everyone thinks their way is right, and the other people are crazy. Yeah, the internet's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that I've had better success with um, bark side up, and there could be other conditions that make that work better in what I was doing. But I, that's how I put them, and. I, you're not going to get me to change either. Yeah. Can I ask you guys a question? I have the opposite problem of rot. My boards are so thirsty, dry all the time that they splinter a lot. And I hmm. stain it twice a year, two coats. Is there anything I should know? Why is it so dry? So the problem with decks generally is they just get hit by the sun. If you think about mm -hmm. a surface in our homes, the only thing that gets as rough a uh, job is roofing materials, right? Mm. I, I mean, unless you have tr shade trees or shade, um, which create other problems for decks, um, they just get killed by the sun. So any coatings or anything you do to it is just not going to last as long. And it, it UV breaks down wood fibers and, and causes that rapid drying that leads to cracks. So it's just a hostile environment would be my answer. You guys have anything to add to that? For Kyle's no. question, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just on the it, on the wood curling thing, because I don't know if I was clear. So when the the bark side will want to when it gets wet, will want to curl toward the inside. And when it dries, it wants to curl back toward the bark. So just to clarify, in case anybody wasn't clear on that, it will curl both directions, depending on whether it's wet or dry. Um, and he goes on to ask about using screws versus nails. Mm -hmm. Um. I find it very difficult as a carpenter to make a living screwing down decks because most people are not willing to pay the labor to do that. And the tool that, that can do it 
quickly, you know, a quick drive kind of screw gun, which has collated fasteners. Miro has one. There's several out there. Um, is expensive, right? So uh, if you have the time to hand screw a deck with an impact drive or a cordless drill, that is certainly the best way. I've also had great success with spiral nails, as Matt suggests, um, driven by a nail gun. Um, there's this company that makes what's called a scrail, which is a, a, a nail that's fired through a nail gun, but you can unscrew it if, if you want to, right? And it seems like a great idea, but I haven't heard... Uh, I've heard mixed reviews about that product. So uh, if anyone out there has used a scrail, uh, let us know because it's, I've heard both and bad things. And uh, I've used the, the quick drive screw gun and maybe you can rent one of those, but it's fantastic. I, the most recent deck I built, I used that and it made what would have taken at least 16 hours of fastening and <sighs> turned it into like a two hour process that's, comparatively easier on your body too which is something else to think of if you're on your hands and knees putting in hundreds of screws it takes a toll on your back i gotta say good knee pads yeah i did like a 2000 square foot maybe azec deck and <sighs> did it all with uh impact driver oh my god <laughs> How long that take your you, elbow killing you oh it was at least a week yeah to Ugh. do all of that yeah it was insane <laughs> of course that's how you did it it wasn't my <laughs> that's, that's what our that's what the boss had. <laughs> and if you're paying someone ten bucks an hour, that's fine, right? But like yeah. if you're trying to make a living as a contractor, you know, you, you mm -hmm. can't most people can't pay you to to do that. So you have to buy the tool. And if you're putting decks out all the time, it's no big deal. But for the average folks, it's not it's not an easy option. Yeah. I think those hidden fasteners take even longer. So, well, that was um, that was a lot of it was just finding the plugs to cap the little cap the screw heads because they drive to a you know they sink the heads and then you got to put these little caps in. You're trying to match the grain, so that probably and take, so you're sorting through them right to try and right. get the so right you, one. Yeah, you're like dumping out the whole bag in your hand and going through trying to find oh. one that looks similar and then you know Do aligning it. In? No, they just get tapped in. They're they're uh, tapered, Kylie, so they, uh, they fit pretty tight. Okay, yeah, like a little plug. So that's yeah. why decks cost tens of thousands of dollars, right? And yeah. the first time I heard of a deck costing twenty grand, I was like, "How is that possible?" But when you have to do that kind of labor, mm. my gosh, it's no wonder. Yeah. How's your deck fastened, Jeff? It's nailed. Did you put it in? No, but when I'm replacing them, I'm screwing them. So. So have you had, had nail pops? No, I haven't. Yeah. Um, I think if you use screw fast screw shaped fasteners, it's it's a pretty good way. Yeah. Well, that's a good question, and uh, I love talking about decks. Decks are one of my favorite projects. There's like nothing that you get as much satisfaction from as quickly as putting up a deck frame. We Screwing down the boards deck. is not fun. We have that new deck guide that's fantastic. Have you guys looked at all the work that Rob's been doing on that thing? Yeah, you want to talk about that, Kylie? Well, he's just been making these lists, like he's been bundling content such that if you are interested in learning about decks, all of our content related to decks is in one place now. So it's just, it's a, it's a real resource. It's almost like a, I don't know. It's, how like, they to, it's like a guidebook kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. It's very so cool. Wal Walter should definitely check that out, right? Yeah. And uh, anyone else who's in doing a deck should check it out. People used to sell decks as an easy project. I remember when I was a kid, we'd go to the home center and you could pick up a free pamphlet, like for many home projects and <laughs> building a deck was one of them. And I can tell you, my dad had no business building a deck, but we did it anyway. Well, there were no deck codes back then. So. <laughs> <laughs> Our deck would have not passed a modern deck building code, I can tell you. Actually, how, how far off the ground does a deck need to be before handrails are or guardrails are required oh go oh. matt <laughs> do i know this off the top of my head what is it it seems like did, something you would know did yeah, you i should know it. the experts on this recently yeah oh, we've had all kinds of things on it recently it's i think it's 30 inches i want to say but i, I i'm something probably like wrong that. it's either 30 or 36 36 yeah, yeah that sounds like i say if it's tall enough that you could hurt yourself and, and not step ankle. down you need a railing yeah, yeah. I think the code is, in, in this instance, especially lenient, and I don't mm -hmm. think that's the case very often. Yeah. Uh, this comes from Eric. 
First of all, thank you for all the information and entertainment over the past 237 episodes. Whoosh. That's a long time, right? <laughs> And it only feels like 236, I tell you. It's also been great to hear familiar voices with all that is going on in the world at the moment. So I appreciate you keeping up your good work. I have a litany of questions, but have attempted to narrow down it to just one. My house could be described as a greatest hits album of FHB podcast discussion topics since episode one. Poorly air-sealed attic with mouse-infested vermiculite insulation? Check. <laughs> Awkward knee walls with cathedral ceilings stuffed with dirty compressed fiberglass bats. Yup. Uninsulated crawl space with embedded joist ends. Have that. Masonry walls covered in disintegrating half-inch EPS under vinyl siding. Oh, yeah. I could go on, but the priority for the moment is addressing a crumbling water-damaged stucco chimney that looks like it was painted at some point. Because we now have a direct vent condensing boiler and indirect hot water heater, the only appliance that uses the chimney is a propane fireplace. My thoughts as far as addressing the chimney damage are as the following. Stucco repair seems to have a pretty steep learning curve. It's a large area and the portion of the chimney facing the roof seems challenging to safely access, at least for me. I'm usually ambitious, but not hugely excited about this as a DIY project. That's good because you have a self-preservation instinct. <laughs> um, stucco in general seems to have a potential for a lot of problems and it's not particularly common in the Northeast. So recruiting good tradespeople to fix it long term is questionable. I'd love to remove the chimney to both avoid the repair question and to reduce the energy bills. Um, but we actually like using the fireplace a handful of times a year. I've confirmed with the manufacturer that it can be converted into direct, direct vent. Also, elimination of the chimney might ruin the beautiful 1950 concrete block slathered in final, faded vinyl architectural beauty that we currently enjoy. <laughs> so how would you approach this? Attempt to push the DIY skills to new levels, hire out the work, swap out the fireplace, and demo the chimney, or as Matt would likely suggest, burn it to the ground <laughs> and move. <laughs> Appreciate the thoughts of the Collective Brain Trust. Stay safe. Eric. Eric, that is a great letter. Thank you. Oh my God. So this is a fantastic question. All right. Like, Matt, I know you're chomping at the bit to get at this one, right? Well, I've got questions like what's underneath the stucco is it brick is it part of my guess is it's concrete <laughs> block because the yeah. rest of the house is concrete block yeah well i think that's kind of like a uh, it would be relatively easy for him to fix i think if he wanted to try stucco this is like the you know probably the easiest stucco situation he's ever going to come across because it's so effed up <laughs> Well, I mean, he just has to kind of chip it down to just chip it down to something solid, and then he can cover it with a lime plast lime based stucco, and that's a pretty easy thing, and it's relatively low risk because it takes so long to cure. If you're like doing it right, you have quite a bit of time to work with the stuff and smooth it out to whatever texture you want, or brush it or whatever. And I mean, and it's really not that hard to chip off if or you know knock it off if you if you really screw it up and start over again. Are you saying that stucco can be applied to just about any material? I mean, as long as the surface is properly prepped, um, you can apply it to a lot of different things. I mean, I did it on, on drywall in my own house and it's been up there about a year and a half now and no cracks. That's also anything. indoors. That's yeah. indoors. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, outside, he just has to make sure that, you know, water's not getting behind it or whatever, but I mean, it's not uncommon for, uh, you know, some sort of stucco to be sort of like a sacrificial layer on top of masonry. So that's probably sort of what the idea behind this was, as, as well as decorative. But it's really not that it's really not that hard to do. I mean, you need a minimal amount of tools and you can hand mix all the stuff and just have at it. I knew you were <laughs> going to tell him to fix this stucco. So how's he <laughs> how's he going to get up there? Uh, that's, well, I have to, to see what. I'd have to see what the situation is like for my well, own so chimney. On the, on the roof yeah. slope side of the chimney, that is a difficult yeah. thing to go. And you put a, you lean a ladder against there. There is no guarantee that thing isn't going to topple over. Yeah. Oh, Matt, no, that would be building something. Well, right? I mean, if it's a block, if it's a block chimney, I don't have any, any worries really that it's going to topple over. I don't think as long as it's, you know, structurally sound. <laughs> no, no, I hope no, people could see that expression on my face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it's, if the block work itself is still in good shape, 
shape. I mean, that's that's one thing he'll definitely have to check out. I mean, as he takes that stucco off, if the if that's in poor shape, then he definitely needs to call in a mason. I wouldn't be handling that myself as a DIYer. But so I got some thoughts on this chimney, and, and I'm going to move this conversation along. Uh, it, for this chimney, like all masonry chimneys, it probably had or like should have an. Uh, like a watertight cap on the top of it, right? It, it, water is getting in between the flue liner most likely and freezing and it's blowing the stucco off or it's freezing in the winter time, right? And so the a... crown is meant to shed water so you don't get it in between the layers of the masonry. In this case, it's stucco and block, I think. And um, so that needs to be repaired in a minimum before you even attempt to fix the stucco. Um, but there's Frankly, also a pretty good go chance that like the stucco itself just cracked because of, you know, differential uh, expansion and contraction of the, the concrete block below and the and the stucco on the face of it. And because we don't know what the the makeup of the stucco is either. So, well, I know it's a cold enough place that the trees lose their leaves. So if if that's yeah. the case, it could be. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's getting water in it and freezing. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing. The water is getting in somewhere. It's either getting in through the cap or it's getting in through the, the cracks that have developed in the faces of it. But So I, I want to jump to something. So I have this friend, Mark, and uh, Mark is not an ordinary human being. Mark, uh, as, as one example, belongs to the Catskills 3500 Club. Do you know what that is, Matt? Climbing all the uh, 35 and up, 3,500 and up peaks. So like Slide Mountain, Cornell, Wittenberg. Yeah. As I understand it, it's like it's like a few hundred people in in the country who have who have done this, right? Um, Overachievers. <laughs> another example is he teaches uh, at the um, National Outdoor Leadership School Winter Mountaineering Skills to other future guides uh, mm. in the dead of winter in the Adirondacks. Um, Sounds awesome. I put a, I put a, a photograph of the retaining wall Mark built on the podcast page that I swear to God, it's 100 feet long and eight feet tall. <laughs> and he did this without machinery. It's like this guy is, is superhuman. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what he said about stucco. As part of this retaining wall project, he was making a, a walkout of his uh, basement. So he dug out this part of the foundation, put retaining walls up, and then had partially uh, partial foundation wall of masonry and then um, framing in some parts that a good way to tie those two things together is to to put stucco on all of it right and then it all looks the same and it's a it's a durable coating for this kind of environment so um, this is what he said about stucco Ah, well, like most things, there's more to learn than it meets the eye. More variables to manage than initially take into account. It was surprisingly physically taxing. And like most things, the only way to really learn is to jump in, make a mess of it, and keep swimming. And so what 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 brought this to mind was I saw on Facebook, and he, he showed the, the pictures of his stucco work. And um, and it's at the, at the bottom of his post, it says, things I have learned about stucco. One. Stucco is effing hard work. <laughs> Two, you got to be willing to let the stuff that falls away go. Three, stucco is hard effing work. So <laughs> mm -hmm. if, if Mark says that stucco <laughs> is hard work, I got to believe him. I, yeah. And my experiences with stucco have not been all that positive. So for what that's worth, I've done. Matt says uh, you should fix it. Yeah. Well, I mean, once you get going once you've done it for a couple weeks <laughs> you're not going to do it for that long <laughs> but i mean I, I remember the first straw bell house i worked on that was my first experience with uh with stucco and i mean it was definitely like the first week of you know stuccoing the exterior walls uh my shoulders just killed me every day but your forearms <laughs> like after about like two weeks your forearms and your shoulders start to get like, you know, used to it. They get like all veiny and hard and then <laughs> you, and then it's not so hard anymore. And then you just get go. You just that do would it. motivate me. I'd be doing yeah. it. <laughs> so at, at a minimum, if I were going to attempt to repair the stucco on this, I would bet rent one of those uh, little cherry pickers they have at the home center that you tow behind. And hopefully your lot is flat enough that you could tow that to somewhere where you could get to the backside of the chimney without risking your life, putting a ladder against the backside. Um, and I think even leaning against the front side with a ladder is dangerous because you really don't know how sound this masonry is. And 
contrary to what Matt says, uh, you can push over an old brick chimney from a roof because I have done it. It is. It, they oh, are I'm very. Not, I'm not yeah. saying it can't be done, but I, do we have <clears throat> pictures of this? That's why I said yeah. I have yeah. questions. I don't. I don't even know what this thing looks like. Is it that oh. tall? It's pretty tall. So it's in, it's in the eave, and it has to be taller than the ridge. So there is a lot of it that is above the roof. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like it's two or three feet. It looks like it's more like 10 or 8. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I would really be tempted to take this thing all the way down for the reasons that our uh, listener identified. And for the amount of money you're going to save compared to having this thing restored by a mason and put up scaffolding and uh, rebuild it, you could buy a new direct vent gas fireplace and put it in and it would be probably safer than the one you have. You'd still have that and you, you would get rid of this thing. And um, I don't know what you do about the hole in the roof where it used to be, but I mean, that's going to be easier to patch than patch the stucco, I would say. So I didn't get the impression he was attached to it aesthetically, did you? I didn't get that impression either. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he'll even need to like this roof looks like it's so low slope. It looks like maybe a four pitch roof. Like he wouldn't need to even lean a ladder against that thing. How's he going to reach the top of it to do the work? He could get one of those ladders that sort of like adjusts, you know, unevenly the legs. Oh yeah. I've that sounds safe and easy. Yeah, that, yeah. On top of the yeah. roof. <laughs> oh yeah. It'll be fine. Shut up, Matt. <laughs> you guys are so risk averse. Jeff, what's your what's your uh, final take on this? I mean, I mean, I my vote would be if at all possible, lose it. Yeah, that would be. Mine you know, too. Matt is gonna want to like do <laughs> a stuck out or plaster work at any well, opportunity. We've so. determined that there's something terribly wrong with Matt to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good one, Jeff. <laughs> Not untrue. There's a huge hole in this thing, though. I don't. I like. I really want to know what's going on with that chimney. That's crazy. So, uh, what's this person's name? Um, Eric. Eric, the Eric. Matt wants to come over. He promises to keep <laughs> his social distance. He's going to climb up on your roof and check out your chimney and tell you yeah. what to do. Well, I mean, most and of the cracks look like they're happening. Patrick's going to come over with a sledgehammer and just knock it down. <laughs> I'm just going to push at the roof because I know you can. Gonna... Yeah. <laughs> The cracking looks like it's happening all at the like at the joints in the block. So that makes me think that I don't know. <laughs> it's gonna fall down. I don't know. Yeah, there may be some problems in the block work itself, but I don't know. I think there's a safe bet there's some problems. All right. So our next question comes from Paul, and Paul is in Bozeman, Montana. And he Paul's got a really long letter, so I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I'm gonna hit the highlights. He says, A few years ago I bought a small home just outside Bozeman, Montana. I'm going to do a full gut re renovation slash remodel, but I'm still in the planning and design stages. How far I take the renovation, as especially as it affects the roof, is, go is going to be dependent on how crazy I need to get with reframing. Okay, so Paul goes on to explain the, the house, and uh, he wants to know, does it make sense to pull off this second story, which is framed very oddly? It was clearly built, built by somebody who didn't have a good ha handle on uh, structural engineering. So what's going on in this house is that the second floor floor joist can lever beyond first floor exterior bearing walls. On those joist ends that overhang the first floor are other walls that are knee, knee high height partial height and the rafters bear on them. And um, what has happened over time is that the roof loading has pushed down the ends of those joists enough that it's noticeable on the inside of the house where there's a bearing wall that the joist ends are higher. And so those of you who are trying to figure this out and can't visualize it, there's a drawing he made um, on our podcast page. And what's interesting about him is he's presently a carpenter and skilled in this stuff. And he's also studying to be an architect. So he very savvily realizes that this house is screwed up. And should he just rip off the second story and start over again? Or because this house has been standing for uh, since 1880, do you just live with its structural deficiencies and uh, work with the building envelope? And I'm going to let someone else go because uh, I have I have different I have some I have conflicted ideas about what to do about this thing. Well, 
I can't tell how, what part of it is supposed to have been original. And it, it sounds like it was all originally a hip roof. And then they turned one into a gable and it's two by four rafters. I mean, I, man, this is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really so, underbuilt, right? So it looks like what actually, so the, the ceiling joists are the things that are, are sort of cantilevered out and the rafters land on them. So it's not the, the first floor framing that's, that's cantilevered out. This is so bizarre. Who, are you saying that they penetrate the wall? Yeah. The, like the seal, what would essentially be the ceiling joists extend, I don't know, we'll say two feet out on either side of the building and the rafters, instead of coming down and, and landing and having those ceiling joists just act as rafter ties, they're actually bearing the full weight of those rafter ends. And so they're getting pushed down by the weight of the roof load. Man. And can I point out that isn't like Bozeman, Montana, one of the like snowiest places or is it dry? Um, at least in the summer, it's pretty dry. I don't, I haven't been there in the I winter. I think they get a lot of snow. Yeah. Um, cause oh, that's they definitely, really, they definitely get snow in the winter. Yeah. That's what would worry me. You know, you get one of those once a hundred year snowstorms and you might get five or six feet of snow. Right. And, and what if it rains after that? And you know what I mean? It's, it's probably fair to say that's happened in the past and yet it stands. <laughs> So Kylie, um, I'm, like, what would you do here? So the, the, I guess it the seems two like choices... something that should be fixed. I mean, that it just sounds like screwy construction. That uh, of course I don't know about it, but it, I think he's probably smart to be concerned. Well, I think because he's a carpenter and a, a you know right. a budding architect, he he gets the the situation here. I, yeah. I've never seen a building built like this. <laughs> would, would you fix? <laughs> would you attempt to try to fix it yourself, or would, what would you do? I would tear it off. Mm. I would tear it off and start over again. And uh, especially, it sounds like he's going to be doing a lot of this work himself. Mm -hmm. You know, chasing these structural problems and, and, and finishing the space with all this wonky framing, boy, that stuff just takes so much longer than if you have nice straight floors and level walls, right? It's just, it, you're just chasing every step of the process. Everything becomes a custom piece. Everything mm -hmm. has to be scribed and fit. It's just so slow. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it's going to take away what I think makes old buildings cool, which is they're they're not perfect and mm -hmm. uh, sloping floors and weird walls. I I think are cool. So yeah. like when I said I was conflicted about what to do, it's for that reason, not because uh, what's easier or uh, the the better choice. I would say handily is rip this off and start from a, a, a like a level structurally sufficient first floor yeah he's probably gonna have to do some wall straightening i would imagine because the i i don't see how those aren't causing those outside walls to tip in unless there's a lot of structure or sort out. of resisting it um but i mean <laughs> and something else sort of holding that the center of those ceiling joists or or rafter ties down i don't i don't without a picture it's really hard to tell what's going on but <laughs> i uh what do you think, Jeff? I, I tend to agree that I can't see how you can fix this without doing more work than ripping it off and starting over. Yeah. I mean, you might save some material costs sticking with this original frame, uh, which if you're doing work yourself, that's often a huge deal, right? I mean, if, if all you have is time and no money, you work with what you got. If, if you have some cash to spend on this project, Oh my God, it's going to make your life so much easier to start fresh with yeah. fresh framing on that mm -hmm. level. Could you sell it to somebody <laughs> else? Make it somebody else's problem. Is it heavily insured? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What kind of insurance you got? <laughs> so the question was not like, yeah, for the last one that said, should we burn it down? It's this one. Should we burn it down? I would say. Um, yeah. So right. if you all are interested, you should read the entire, uh, the details in the letter. And uh, it's a pretty good email. Um, it was, it's a, a cool place to live. Uh, I hope you uh, do well on your architecture test. And uh, please keep us posted because this was totally amazing. Um, Paul, 
why did you buy this thing? <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I bet it looks cool from the outside. Mm -hmm. I'm sure affordable houses in Bozeman, Mont Montana are really tough to come by. Yeah. And I'm, I'm betting that that's why Paul ended up with this house, right? It's, it's a really yeah. desirable place, isn't it? Yeah, this is like where super wealthy people build super huge homes, right? It's been a long oh, time boy. since I was there. I don't know. <laughs> so I, I tried really hard to find a good end note today, but I couldn't. So oh. I'm going to... I'm going to ask my own question, both to you guys and to our listeners. Um, so like a lot of people of my age, uh, and, and you'll know my age when I say that I have this huge CD collection <laughs> and I am at a loss of what to do with it, right? Um, ask I Rob never, Rotzak. I never use them. <laughs> uh, I, most of the music I listen to, and I do listen to music pretty often, is on YouTube. Um, really? You listen to music on YouTube? All the time. Don't you have to listen to commercials and breaks and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's horrible. But I, I, uh, I'm cheap. And uh, I do. And once again, uh, you know, owing to being a certain age, I do enjoy music videos, especially from um, my 20s. Uh, Nirvana and The Smiths and all this stuff that I should have gotten out of my system decades ago. But anyway. Um, <laughs> So what do you guys think I should do with these CDs that are only a collection that really serve me no purpose? I should think I, A, to... like digitize them? Should I make some shelving to put them on? Should I give them to a worthy cause? Or should I throw them in the dumpster? So I, I think, think those are my options. I think you have another option. I think you need to fork them over to me and I will give them to my next door neighbor and he will make some kind of crazy art installation out of them because they're junk and you don't need them. <laughs> give them to Liam and put them in the microwave. <laughs> that's a pretty fun thing to do with CDs. I am, I'm actually well, I bet that's very exciting. <laughs> I'm in it the is same exciting boat, Patrick. Like I have a second. huge box of them. I don't know yeah. what to do either. As if, that's a tough one for me because I can't. Do I see I, hundreds of CDs on your bookcase there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't see my four or 500 up over here just to my right. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the last uh, Shop Talk Live at the end of the show, Ben always does ask for recommendations. My recommendation was to pull out your old cassettes and listen. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> So I got those rid of those years ago. Well, yeah. probably the majority of them didn't work because I left them in the car in summer days, right? And they all melted. Uh -huh. You remember taking a pencil and twisting them back oh, yeah. into? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so another yeah. uh, indicator of how old I was was so I studied video editing when I was in college, and um, we were still using tape. And one time the tape deck ate my tape and I remember pulling out hundreds of feet of my hours of project and just like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. But I wound it all back in there and they were able to, to make a new generation and it wasn't a big deal. But I don't miss tape, so I got rid of those things as soon as I could. I still have some tapes, but no way to play them. Yeah, right. Uh, Do you guys have any vinyl? Put them up to your ear and shake them. Yeah. Do you, guys have, you have any vinyl that you listen to? I've got I some don't. vinyl, but I also don't have a record player anymore. So <laughs> I got it. Like, these are things that are like on my list of things to buy at like uh -huh. a, at a swap meet or yeah, like, yeah. whatever. Well, any of you out there who have ideas on what I should do with my CD collection, I would be grateful. And no, I'm not going to make siding out of them, although they would make pretty <laughs> cool fish scale shingles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to do that either. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Matt, Kylie, and Jeff for joining me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Stay safe and happy building.